Welcome, welcome, welcome to our midweek Bible study. Hope everyone is doing well. I'm just adjusting the sound here. And um, <clears throat> great to have everybody on or as we're logging on for our virtual midweek Bible study. I hope all is well. Everybody's doing well. We'll get started in a few minutes. We'll give folks a little bit more time to log on. How's everybody doing out there? Go ahead and do a, just a thumbs up or just a little heart uh, or one of those like buttons so I can know that you can hear me and um, that I'm seeing everybody well. Hi, Miss Stephanie. How are you? Good to see you. Corky, Eric. Um, I can't see everyone there. Okay, great. That lets me know that uh, the volume is good. There's Deb, Adrian. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's great to see everyone. Great to see everyone. Okay, it's about 7.30, maybe 7.31. We'll get started here in a little bit. Um, but um, it's great to have this time together. I know we are still in the middle of this pandemic. And... Um, Boy, I tell you, uh, we just have to keep praying. Uh, at one point, it seemed like uh, we were seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but I don't know, man. Um, looks like the latest reports are uh, more, more and more infections are on the rise. But man, let's, let's keep praying. Uh, let's uh, keep uh, doing all of the things we need to do to socially distance and wear our mask and uh, do the things we need to do so we can get this thing under control so we can get back to seeing each other, being with each other, and uh, sharing in that um, personal connectivity. But nonetheless, it's great uh, to have the technology to be able to, to do this virtually. So I'm so grateful for all of you that we're on together uh, on Wednesday nights and on Sunday mornings uh, virtually. So anyway, um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started here for our Bible study. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start with a word of prayer and, uh, and then we're going to jump on in and, uh, and have a great time together. Let's, let's bow our heads uh, in prayer together. Dear God, thank you so much for your continued grace and mercy, your love. Father, we are so grateful to share together uh, in, in the things that bring us together, the common purposes, the, the great commission, the great commandments, Father, and obviously, uh, just your son, Jesus Christ, who, who calls us together in one fellowship. And so um, together, as we open your word tonight, we pray uh, that your spirit will speak to us, that you will continue to lead us and guide us. And Father, take us to the places you want us to go, individually and collectively, so that we can be uh, the, 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 the fellowship that you need us to be, to be a light in this world that we live in today. So be with us, be with me tonight. Let your spirit speak. We love you and we praise you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, welcome to our midweek Bible study. And uh, tonight we're going to continue in our series that we've been doing uh, on koinonia. Koinonia uh, and um, what it means to be a part of the e ecclesia of God. Those two Greek words uh, Daryl's been focusing on. And uh, we've been learning a lot about that. And um, on Sunday, we, we talked about the idea of really that in fellowship, in the called out people of God, that, man, there are certain things that characterize who we are and uh, that we are compelled by love. We are compassionate. Um, man, we are committed to each other. We're connected to each other. And that those are the things, even though we're not perfect, that this is us. And so there's also a sense of power in us. And that was one of the points that I made on Sunday. But I want to continue in that vein tonight. Koinonia, the power of us. That's what we want to talk about tonight. And really, 
This Bible study is about exploring how we can go deeper, how we can get stronger, how we can grow closer together as the ecclesia, the ecclesia of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you guys remember. Can you guys put in the chat if you remember what that word ecclesia mean or ecclesia? I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong. Ecclesia, actually. You remember what that word means? Go ahead and put it in the chat if you remember what that one means. Or put it in the, in the comments there. Ecclesia. What does that word mean? Ecclesia. And then koinonia. Also koinonia. What, what does that one mean? Put that one in there uh, if you, if you uh, remember. But again, I, you know that, this series is all about that about being the ecclesia of God and, 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 and sharing in the koinonia that comes from being in the ecclesia. Uh, I don't see any takers. I haven't seen anybody put any, anything in the chat yet. Um, so I'll go ahead and let you know. So koinonia really means fellowship, commune, to commune or koinonia means fellowship. Yes, I think Anna said for ecclesia, it does mean church or the gathering or the call or the called out people of God. I think Russell put community, Emily put church. Okay, you guys are on it. You guys are on it. I'm glad you're paying attention. Glad you're paying attention. But why is this important? Why is this important? Because I think more and more as we look into our society that we live in today, not only is um, really the authority of the Bible constantly being challenged or being questioned, um, not only is really the, the existence of God or really the objective morality that comes from a one true God uh, being challenged, but really the church, the importance of the church, the significance of the church, and, 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 and really the, the purpose of the church in the world is, is being questioned, is being challenged, is being undermined. And so much so that more and more people are less in, enthralled or less inspired or less motivated to go to church or even be a part of a church or be committed to a true church. And really, part of this Bible study is to equip us so that we can be able to handle uh, when our friends or family members or, or, or anyone that we may know uh, may have something adverse to say about the church or they may have a, 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 a negative experience from church. We can be able to correct and give the truth of what the true church should look like and, and how we experience the true church in our lives. And so tonight we're talking about, man, not only this is us, but man, the power of us and how that's part of God's plan uh, in the church and what the church is all about. And so the Bible says in Colossians chapter one, we'll start there for some of our scriptures tonight. We're gonna look at a couple of scriptures and then just got a couple points that we're gonna draw away. Uh, from the scriptures tonight. But in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, the Bible says, The Son is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation, for in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, and visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And one of the points that... I think we can take away from this scripture is that, boy, Jesus is the head of the church. And here this scripture describes the church as his body. And so, you know, many people, however, you often hear statements like, man, I'm into Jesus and I'm into God. I just don't do the church thing. Or I, I respect God. I respect Jesus. But Man, you know, people in church are just mean or, or whatever the case may be. I'm here to tell you, according to the scriptures, you can't do Jesus and not do the church. You can't have the head and say, well, I don't want anything to do with the body. That's like wanting the chick without the filet. You know, if you want, if you chick filet, you know me, I'm a big chick filet fan, but you can't have the chick without the filet. Or what about... You can't have the mac without the cheese. You guys, you know what I'm talking about? Then it's not mac and cheese. 
That's like wanting the peanut butter and jelly without the peanut butter in, in the jelly sandwich. Anyway, you kind of get my point. Th this is important. This is so important. You know why? Because over the years, the church has gotten a bad reputation. I understand why. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of grew up in church, and I remember some of the some of the things that turned me away from church. And I, I even remember at a point having this, this, this conviction uh, that, man, you know, I, I have a consciousness of God. This is pre, pre, pre me uh, be, become a true follower of Christ and really understanding more about the importance of the church. But yeah, I, I got a consciousness of God. You know, I, I know some scripture. Man, that's all I need. I don't, I don't need to necessarily be around those people. And the reason why is because, you know, I, I, I myself, and I've heard this excuse in many places and, and at many times, that, man, the church is full of hypocrites. Have you heard that before? You know, church is full of hypocrites. So many people here in America associate their experience with going to church or, their, or whatever their experience in church being that, man, you know, it's just full of hypocrites. And in fact, uh, the number one reason why skeptics or unbelievers or or people who might have an, an adverse uh, idea towards God, uh, their reason for not going to church is because for this very same reason. They say that the church is, 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 is about hypocrisy. And to a certain degree, there's some truth in that, right? I mean, there's some churches that you go to, man, you find some of the meanest people. I'm saying, though, but that's not the reflection of the true church. And we have to make sure that D.C. Region, that, uh, man, our commitment to church, our conviction about church is so strong, so vibrant, so, so, so right, uh, rightly uh, 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 grounded in Scripture uh, and obedience to the Word that we could never have that uh, kind of label with D.C. Regional. But that's one reason why. People have this kind of idea that, man, I, I, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I, I, I'm, I, I don't want anything to do with church. Another reason why is, is because of kind of a new teaching that's come along within the last 20, 25 years or so. This whole idea of the prosperity gospel. Some people associate church with prosperity gospel because prosperity gospel sort of kind of made its way into American mainstream because of TV, because of television, because of access uh, to, to broad media outlets, and you had these televangelists or different types of, of, uh, of, of prosperity gospel preachers who were out there preaching a false and fake gospel. And uh, essentially their gospel was saying that they as preachers were entitled to lavish lifestyles that, you know, and, and, and this teaching that God only blesses those who are faithful or they're, they're, there's a blessing waiting for you and, and those kinds of things. And uh, which is really completely opposite of the teachings of Jesus. One of the fundamental teachings of Jesus is that in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, that anyone who will come after me must first deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So this whole idea that, man, it's all about being blessed and, and, and man, you know, the, the closer you God you are, the more blessed you'll be. Let me tell you something. Being blessed is not about what you have. Being blessed is about who you have. It's about having Christ. It's about having Christ in you and you and him and with those that you get to do life with. If you have Jesus, you are blessed. If you have good friends, you are blessed. Some of the most blessed people on earth are people that have little or no possessions. But they don't find their identity in their little or no possessions. They find their identity in Christ. And Jesus teaches us that we must take up our, we must deny ourselves and take up our crosses daily, which is an indication that, man, what comes along with the blessing of being in Christ is also the struggle of being in Christ. It's also about the perseverance that comes along with being in Christ. And really, we need each other to make it and to be strong. You know, a third reason why people associate themselves with Jesus or claim to, man, I, I, I'm, I'm cool with God, I'm cool with great Jesus, but I don't want anything to do with this church is because of the religiosity, because of the religiosity. So we see people have an issue with hypocrisy. I think sometimes people have a his, uh, uh, history with uh, prosperity gospel, which is a false gospel, which is no gospel at all. And sometimes people have an issue with the religiosity. You know, I've heard this quote from time to time. Sometimes people in the church can be so heavenly focused that they serve no earthly good. 
<laughs> Sometimes people can be so heavenly focused that they don't serve any earthly good. In other words, man, they can be, you know, sometimes we can we can have, or Christians can have this religious demeanor, this, I mean, I, I know more than you, I'm better than you are, you know, man, I, I know my scriptures, but don't have a, a heart to relate to people. You see, the church is not about religiosity. It's not even about religion. That's not God's original plan for the church. It really is about relationships. It's about relationship, the koinonia, the ecclesia, ecclesia, the called out people, the gathering people of God. You know, there are two purposes, really two purposes that the church, for reasons why the church exists. One is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26. And for you and I as brothers and sisters, as partners in the gospel, as, as believers, as members of the, of, of the called out people of God, one of our, our purposes, we can never get tired of this, is to proclaim the death of Christ until he returns. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul was referring to when the church came together, that they would share in that communion time, that time to remember the, the, Jesus's sacrifice, his death, burial, and resurrection. And you know what, man? This upcoming Sunday, boy, is Easter 2021. And we as Christians, we have the chance to celebrate the hope of all hopes, the King of kings, the one and only who's risen from the dead. He is risen, and he is risen indeed. This is our Super Bowl Sunday for the Christian faith. We get to proclaim his death, his burial, and his resurrection until he comes. That's the purpose, or one purpose, of the church. We get to tell the story about the miracle of God, the power of God, really the power of God. And if God can raise Jesus from the dead, that he can raise any situation that's dead in your life. That God can bring to life any dead relationship. He can bring to life dead dreams. He can rise from the dead, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, dead hopes and, and hopeless situations. And that's the hope that we have in Christ. We have the opportunity as the church to proclaim that. You know, the second purpose of the church really is to proclaim and preach the gospel, the good news to a lost and hurting world. And Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And, and, and he says, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. It's a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. You remember, you remember when the gospel was preached to you? When you recognized that it wasn't because of anything that you could do, but it was because of what Jesus did on the cross for you, that you deserved death, that I deserved death, that we, we were objects of wrath. We were deserving of the punishment of God because of our sin and because of our poor decisions and because of the way that we treated God as an unholy thing. And God sent his son Jesus to die on our behalf, to, to take the cross, to take the punishment of death in our place and, and replace it with Christ himself, that he who was righteous became what was unrighteous in us so that we can now be the righteousness of God. And we responded to that message. And here we are today. We have the opportunity to tell that good news to those who haven't heard it. That's the purpose of the church. Brothers and sisters, we can never stop telling the good news, proclaiming the gospel. We can never be ashamed of the gospel because it's the good news. So what does that have to do with us? Well, in order for us to do those, accomplish those two purposes, to proclaim the, the, the death of Christ in this world uh, and then to proclaim the gospel to this lost world, I believe there, there, we have to understand and recognize the power of us. And this has been a, a theme that's been following through the scriptures from the very beginning. That when God first initiated his redemption plan, 
that one of the things, actually when he first created uh, humans on this planet, which I'm going to share here in a minute, man, he wanted us to understand the power of us. That, hey, Christianity, the church, is not a spectator sport. Can I get an amen on that right there? First of all, if we're Christians, man, we got to be active. We got to be involved. We got to be, coach, put me in the game. It's not a spectator sport, okay? But most of Christianity is not an individual sport either. Sorry to my brother Carter. He's a great tennis player. Uh, I know he plays doubles and things like that too. But man, yeah, it's, you know, and then to my golfers out there, the brothers and, brothers and sisters who play golf, uh, distance runners out there, you know, man, who might go out for long runs by yourself from time to time. Hey, man, Christianity is not an individual sport. Christianity is also not a, a non-contact sport. In other words, we as Christians have to stay engaged with each other. And even from time to time, we're going to come up against our enemies. We're going to come up against our spiritual enemies or those who may not be in favor of God's plan for the church. Christianity, on the other hand, it is a sport of involvement. And we need every believer on deck. Every member is a minister. Each individual part working together to help each other get to heaven. Can I get an amen on that? You know, Christianity is a team sport. We win together, we lose together. We rise together, we fall together. We ride together, we died. Uh, no, well, you know, well, we might, yeah, hey, amen. Anyway, we win together and we lose together. Amen? It's a team sport. Uh, it's a contact sport. You know, from time to time in this, in this, in this, 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 this battle, in this game, man, we, we're going to get fouled. Uh, we're going to get tackled by the enemy. Sometimes, man, we are going to, we, we're going to, we're going to, we, 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 we might, you know, stab, you know, hit each other in the eye from time to time. I'm playing basketball. And um, one time I went up for a rebound and, 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 and it was actually my, um, my teammate, he was going up for the rebound as well. And, and, and he hit me, in the, hit by mistake, hit me, hit me in the eye. And, uh, you know, sometimes we're going to bump into each other. Sometimes we're going to do things, man, that, that, that we come against each other. But we have to learn to love each other, to forgive each other, and to move on. But it's, it's a contact sport. There, there, there's, some, there's some close proximity relational activity that takes place. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to get put down from time to time. But here's the blessing and the power of us. That when you get knocked down, that you have a brother or sister there to help you up. Can you remember a time in your life, spiritually, or even just, man, just personally, where, man, you were down, you've been hit, you were wounded, and, man, you know, you had that brother, that sister, that fellowship, that koinonia to help you get back up and help you get perspective. I'm so grateful. I am so grateful for this church, for, man, the koinonia that I have with all of you, with my brother Daryl and Carlos and Ray and Grady, uh, Daryl Grady and uh, Dijon and, and, and so, Hodge and man, so many others. Uh, I'm so grateful for you because I know that, man, when the time comes, when we get knocked down, boy, I tell you, I'm so grateful that <laughs> I know I'm going to have my brothers to help me up. There's power in us. Say it with me. There's power in us. Put it in the, in the chat. There's power in us. Let's not take us for granted. Let's not take us for granted. You know, Jesus, he says in Matthew chapter 18, you can turn your Bibles there. We looked at this on Sunday, but I want to go back here again in verse 18. He says, truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth, Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 to 20, will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Jesus was having a conversation with, with Peter in particular, but really with all of the disciples. 
And he was addressing something that was, was, was essential to the future of the church, the future of the koinonia. And he was basically saying, you know, there, there, there are going to be times where he, he basically was saying to Peter and the apostles, that I'm giving you guys some, some, some incredible authority here. That the church is so important because after he was going to leave, that the church was going to be the representation of God, the representation of Christ as a collective body, a collective body on earth. And that the church was going to have some incredible authority to bind some things on earth that would also be bound in heaven. That there, the church is, an in, is the intersectionality of the spiritual lives that gets us from, from, really, from earth to heaven through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. But you can't separate Christ from the body. And so he was saying here, he's saying, guys, when, but here, here's the thing. When two of you come together, and he says, and you agree on anything, and he says, listen, when you agree and you come together under my name, he says, there I am with you, that he will never leave us the fellowship that he wants us to have, the same koinonia that he has with God, he wants to have with us. This whole idea of us is so important. In fact, if you look back in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, you know, God, you know, he said, let there be light and boom, and there was light. He said, let there be an expanse, and boom, there was an expanse. God created the world in his power, through his powerful word. Let there be a vault. Boom. Let there be water. Boom. Let there be land. Boom. Let there be the lights. Boom. And, 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 and God was just, he was just creating, he was just creating, he was just creating. And then he got to the crown jewel of his, of his creation in, in, in verse 26. And it's interesting how God introduces himself to mankind. He introduces himself to mankind. As the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, then God said, say it with me, let us make mankind in our image, in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wine animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Okay, hold on. Wait a minute. So I know that, man, we are, we are, uh, a mono, monotheistic religion. In other words, we, we worship one God, not many gods. That's not what this is talking about. This is not saying that, man, God is like many gods. No, 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 no. When he's saying, let us. The word here, or the name of God in this particular passage, and in several other passages, in fact, in tw it, it's over 2,500 references to the Elohim, or the name of God as re referred to us, as referred to as Elohim. Well, the name Elohim here, and in those other references throughout the Old Testament and in some places in the Old Testament uh, is, is a plural form of, of the word El or the name El, which, rever which is really the oldest uh, reference to divinity on record. In, in, in what we see in the Hebrew Bible, in our scriptures here, we see the reference to the Elohim. In other words, it was a, it was a reference to, to, to God as God, the mighty creator. And in other words, he was to describe the, it is to describe the indescribable majesty of God. And to a certain degree, yes, this is referring to the fact that God was in fellowship with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. But he, 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 he's, he's here showing us, again, that God, although he is almighty God, he is alone on his throne, he is a, alone in his omnipotence, he's alone in his supremacy, that God himself is never alone. That God himself was never alone. Even look over in Isaiah chapter 6 real quick. Isaiah chapter 6, and then we can get to some other cool scriptures here. But the point, this whole idea of fellowship, of, I mean, God, he, he revealed himself as the Elohim. And here we see in the same, in, in Isaiah chapter 6 in verse 5, Isaiah the prophet, he was actually uh, in the middle of really a, a, a revelation and he's standing before the throne of God. And uh, he is seeing uh, God uh, getting ready to really give him a, a charge, basically, to um, anoint him and actually give him uh, an assignment because there was a need to go and proclaim God's word. And Isaiah goes, okay, well, uh, I see there's, there's a need for some people to go. And it's interesting how he's referred to here in Isaiah chapter 6. 
in verse 5. He goes, woe to me, I cried. For I am ruined, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty, the one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With, he, with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And then Isaiah says, he says, And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Look at this, he says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here, I, here am I, send me. So we see, really, we see God, the omnipotent, all-powerful, um, omnipresent, omniscient, God Almighty, Elo Elohim, uh, our, our, our God, the only God, the creator God. He says, whom shall I send? But then he goes, well, but who will go for us? Well, who's the us that he's talking about? Obviously, again, talking about Holy Spirit, about Jesus, but there's this sense of, of, of togetherness, even with Almighty God. And this is the same kind of koinonia, fellowship, communion, uh, common sense of togetherness that God initiated when he, uh, he first created mankind and that he wanted to be perpetuated and continued into the New Testament church, the church we see in the Bible and the church that we are expected to be today. You know, in Genesis chapter 2, this is one of those incredible verses Right after, again, God created mankind, uh, you know, he was excited about what he had, uh, he had made. But then in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, what does God say? It is not good for man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. You know, this is such a true and profound statement, isn't it? Alone, you might be able to slow one down. But together, man, we're unstoppable. Alone, you might be able to break someone down. But together, we're unbreakable. Can I get an amen on that right there? You know, alone, the devil will try to shake you down, shake one down. But together, we are unshakable. Alone, one can live in the world of possible, but together, we can do the impossible. Here's the thing. We are better together. We're better together. We're stronger together. But here's the thing. Together is not easy. Together is not easy. You know, sometimes, you, you know, you, you have your uh, close friend, best friend. Uh, but from time to time, man, you know, you, you and your best friend, you get into it. You, <laughs> you have differences of opinion. You have, you have struggles. You have issues. Sometimes forging that unity, forging that togetherness is the challenge. Uh, you know, sometimes in a marriage relationship or in a family or even among siblings, uh, the people you love the most, sometimes you have those issues, those struggles, those challenges. But I think whenever there's a, there's a commitment to staying together, there's a commitment to unity, there's a commitment to loving one another past the issues, past the struggles, past the difficulties, there's victory and there's power in us. You know, my... Um, my, uh, my middle daughter, uh, Leah, she's actually a senior this year, and um, she'll be graduating uh, here shortly in, in May or June, whenever we uh, figure out when the graduation is going to be. But um, she's been applying to different schools around the area and uh, some schools outside of the area. Um, and so uh, one of the schools she applied to was um, University of Maryland of Baltimore County. And she's actually interested in computer science, and um, I'm so proud of her. She's doing very, very well. So she's been looking at all these different programs that are STEM programs. And there's this one in particular at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, it's called the Meyerhoff, uh, Meyerhoff STEM Scholars Program. And um, it was initiated by the president of, of, uh, of UMBC. His name is Freeman Rabowski. And um, this, this program was started over 30 years ago. Uh, and it was particularly started uh, as a way to get more minorities and particularly minority men, uh, black men, into STEM-related careers and STEM-related fields. But not just at the entry level, um, but at the PhD, MD, PhD levels. And uh, 30 years later, um, 
man, this program, the Meyerhoff program, is the world leading producer of uh, of of uh, minority PhD MD or MD PhDs. It's an incredible program. I mean, it, all kinds of uh, engineers, uh, mathematicians, uh, technology related careers, uh, science related careers, research intensive careers. But I, in attending, um, uh, Lee applied for this program, and uh, in attending one of the um, orientations for the program, Mr. Robowski laid out just some principles that he has, you know, established from day one, as and that that he actually really believes is the reason why the program is so successful to this day. In fact, there are uh, five or, or five to seven other schools around the country, top schools in the, in in the country, actually. That actually are are actually using this Myhoff program uh, as as a model for them to follow, so that they can have the same success. I think there's there's oh I I'm, I can't remember how many, but pl plenty of folks. It's a world leading producer of PhD MDs. Anyway, but anyway, one of his convictions that he started early on was that the only way that they were going to be successful is for them to come in as a as a cohort. That not just, you know, when, when, when they get accepted into the program, it wasn't going to be, well, you're, you're my house scholar, you're my house scholar, but it was going to be, this is going to be cohort number one and cohort number two and my house scholar, cohort number three, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things he would always do at the, at the, at the orientation is that he would have the students look to their left and look to their right. And he said the reason why he would do that is because he attended other orientations of other universities and uh, presidents would do that. He would have the students look to your left, look to your right. And those presidents would say, at the end of four years, one of you is not going to be here. And, and Robowski decided, you know, Dr. Robowski decided, you know what, that's not going to be uh, the way our program is going to be run. He said, he actually flipped it. He said, you know what, I tell the students now, when you come in, look to your left and look to your right. At the end of four years, all of you are going to be here. And he said, once they come into the program, part of their conviction is that he gets them, number one, not only to buy into their own personal success, but he gets them to understand that the only way that you're successful is if the people next to you are successful. And it's and and it's been the it's been a successful program. It's worked really, 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 really well. And you know, and 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 to a certain degree, um, man, you know, he even told uh, an an example of a story of one time there was a, a student uh, who um, they were taking a math class or something like that, and um, that student got an A. But one of his co cohort members got an F, and the student was just man. He was, you know, he was excited about getting his A and things like that. And 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 and, and either President Robowski or one of the members of the program pulled him aside and said, "Listen, man, I'm glad you're celebrating your A, but you can't fully celebrate your A until you help that guy bring his F up. After you help him bring his F up, then you have you have successfully <laughs> got an A." And I thought, man, that is so encouraging. And, you know, so in the same way, I think God says to us, when we become Christians, look to your left, look to your right. You know, man, when we, when we get to heaven, not, I uh, mean, you know, when we get to heaven, one of us is not going to be here. No, 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 no. That we have the kind of us in our conviction here at DC region, we go, no, no. <laughs> when, when we get to heaven, all... To my left and to my right, man, we all gonna go. We gonna be there together. We gonna do whatever we can to help each other get there. And so, you know, man, in 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 the in the book of Hebrews, there's a couple of scriptures that again emphasizes this whole us point, this conviction about us. Let us. There are twelve scriptures. I call them the let us passages. They're kind of like the one another passages, but they're specifically uh, in the book of Hebrews. But it, it's it's the, the book of Hebrews was written uh, to a to a struggling community. We don't know exactly who the author was, but we do know one thing that this was a community that was undergoing intense persecution. They were they were doing the best that they can to keep their faith strong. And uh, and, and and essentially what they did, what the writer did, is he said, "Listen, the way that we're going to make it through this time of persecution, the way that we're going to make it to the other side, the way that we're going to get to heaven." is making sure that we do it together. And, 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 and essentially, he basically shared 12 let us passages. I, I shared about four on, on Sunday. I think I'm gonna just hit about, about, you know, about four more tonight. 
uh, just for the sake of time. But turn your Bibles over to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. We're going to look at a couple of them, and, uh, and, uh, and then we're going we're gonna to call it a night here. But man, it's a great study on the book of Hebrews, just understanding this whole idea of us, this whole idea of together. We are together. We are stronger together. We are better together. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Look at this. Look at what he says. He says, in our time of struggle, essentially, as we're going through, as we're dealing with this, he says, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, he says, let us, not me, not you, not individual, he says, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I love this because he's saying, let us find strength in God's grace together. But you said, my bro, but, but you sinned on your own. You, 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 you blew it on your own. You, you messed up on your own. He's saying, listen, if you have some issues, some, some things that you might be struggling by yourself, yes, you have to go to God by yourself. Yes, absolutely. And we have to seek our, 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 our own salvation with fear and trembling. But at the same time, there's power when we're able to share our burdens with each other and go, you know what? Let us find grace in God together. Let's approach his throne of grace with confidence together. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. He says, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. What an incredible scripture. He's saying, you know, it's one thing for us to grow on our own. It's one thing for us to mature on our own. But boy, what power is there when we mature together, when we grow together? Let us move on to maturity together. Can I get an amen on that right there? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Let us let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near to God together. You know, it's awesome to have an incredible time with God, to draw near to God to, by yourself. But can you imagine, man, if you're able to draw near to God together, especially if there's someone that you know that's not doing their best spiritually, and you're able to go along and say, hey, man, come on, let's draw near to God together. Let's experience God together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. I love this one. I love holding on to the hope of heaven together. You know <laughs> Uh, hold on to the hope of heaven together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. There's a story I was going to tell, but I don't have time. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. I love this one. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. You know, the Bible talks about, man, giving each other a holy kiss. Well, this one talks about giving each other a holy kick. Every once in a while, we have to give holy kisses. But every once in a while, we have to get, give each other a holy kick in love. Are you guys with me here? It's about challenging each other, sometimes, by hitting each other where it hurts the most so that we can, we can change the most and get stronger spiritually. That's what spur means. To, 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 man, come on, let's go. We can do it. But man, let's do it together. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I love this one. I love Because, you know, it says throwing off the sin that so easily entangles. That's like, man, if, if I'm in a sin and I don't even realize that I'm in a sin... It's, it's great to have my brother right watching my back and going, man, bro, let me help you get out of that. You mean you're entangled right now. You need some help. Come on, man. Let's do this together. Let us run with perseverance together, together. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, anyway. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, and we'll, we'll, we'll close right here. Since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, praise God, we live in a kingdom that can't be shaken. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe. Let us worship 
God together. Worship God together. It's not just good for us to go. I mean, for, for, for me or you to go alone, it's important for us to go. It's not good enough just for me to grow. It's, it's important for us to grow. It's not good enough for me to draw near to God or you to draw near to God. It's, it's, it's better for us to draw near to God together. Can you imagine if we had this conviction that, man, look to your left, look to your right. Man, you know, man, together we're going to be the best that we can be. We're going to be the best that we can be. We, we're going to be the church. We're going to be the church, the uh, ecclesia that the world is looking for, D.C. Regional. Uh, we're going to be the church that people want to be a part of. If we're going to be the church that God is proud of, we, we got to be the church of us, the church of us. So, amen. I hope this, this, this word encouraged you tonight. Let's, 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 here's a challenge for this week. Let's invite someone who's not a believer, someone you know who's not a believer, to join us for this virtual koinonia on Sunday. It's Easter Sunday. Man, just invite somebody to join us on fellowship, online, to, to be together in fellowship together, to, to, to get to witness us, to get to spend some time with us. And then secondly, I want to encourage us to take these scriptures to heart and be intentional this week about having those one another and let us kind of fellowship with another believer this week. It might be a believer that, man, you haven't seen in a while, or a brother or sister you haven't fellowship with in a while. I want to encourage us, man, let's, let's, let's go after these one another passages that we've been talking about, and let's go after these let us passages that God uh, just encouraged us with tonight. Brothers and sisters, Love you guys so much. Looking forward to Sunday, Easter. We're going to have a great time. Uh, Daryl's going to be preaching an incredible message uh, as we celebrate the hope of, uh, of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you guys. Have a great evening, and we'll see you on Sunday.